You're listening to the UKC Hunting Ops Podcast, celebrating hunting dog heritage, competition, and community. United Kennel Club has been the hunting dog sports home for coonhounds, beagles, retrievers, pointers, cur feist, and more for over 125 years. Alan, we both had Daltra Pathfinder 2s now for a little while. What do you think about yours? I'm liking mine. One of the things I had the opportunity to now download a map of an area where I did not have service, and I've used it there, and it has worked flawlessly. I love it. Yeah, I love the crystal clear maps. I love that I never lose reception on my dog's collars anymore. Highly recommended by me as well. Dogtra Pathfinder 2, the official GPS collar partner of UKC. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the UKC Hunting Ops podcast. I'll be your host today. I'm Todd Kellum, and we are going to talk about all things Epagnol Breton related. Now, don't let that confuse you. That's a term some of you haven't heard, but you're going to learn more about it, and you may be more familiar with it than you think. But this time, I want to introduce our guest today, Mr. Bob Olson. Glad to have you at the UKC studio. Thank you. And uh, I guess Bob and I go way back in the UKC Pointing Dog program, so it'll be fun to catch up on some old times. But, hey, to get us started, let, uh, let's introduce you a little bit. Why don't you tell the reader, or listeners um, what your background is, how you got started in hunting dogs, and brought you, bring us up to where you are today. Okay. Well, I got started with labs years and years ago. and then So my, did I. Yep. So we got that in common. And, uh, I mean, that was meat potato dog you know yep. in, in midwest and then um my brother got into the ebs and bought his first one either new mexico or arizona i don't remember okay. what year would that have been about um, three years 40 years ago yeah it's been a while yeah and uh he then bought a female from rl delrymple okay. in ardmore yep and so I stopped and picked this little female up. We went hunting in, I think we were in Kansas, maybe Nebraska. I don't remember anymore. And took him that dog. And a few years later, he bred him and had a litter. Now, I knew nothing really about the breed, um, but I could buy a dog from him. Yeah, right. And so I got a puppy. And so uh, um, that Did was- Did you that. still have labs at the time? So yeah. this was a new, uh, new venture, getting a pointing dog. Right. So I went from flushing- to pointing right um knew nothing about it i mean flushing not too hard yeah um and so uh uh just start with alex and uh paul ellers who i believe you know yeah was a good friend of my brother's he had skipper and so they were litter mates that we had until we you know they both passed and then as we went along um bought um another dog a female abby from uh dylan's oh yeah kathy dylan's yeah and then from uh, uh, up in Minnesota, the brothers. I can't remember the brothers in Minnesota. Yeah, I know who you're thinking of, too. Anyways. Moody's. Moons. And so uh, um, got a, a male and a female, a few months uh, apart from them. Night and day different as far as, you know, dogs, which you can expect. And then, you know, from then... We bought one from uh, Dinsmore. Yep. Bought one from um, um, Fred. Yep. At Overby, and one from uh, Chuck Moore. And so, um, and then we traded one with Clint Ferry, you know, somewhere in the line. Sure. And um, so we've got five at home. The youngest is probably like 14, 15 months, and that's Taz. Um, he was up here at the top 10, and so was yep. uh, Sam. At the top ten, so that's kind of how we got into the dogs and kind of the last so thirty. So you years. and your brother grew up in a hunting household. Did you have a father or uncle's family that hunted? Not that really. Get Not, both jumped in and said, "We have something we want to do." We we started shooting clay birds. Yep. And reloading our own shells, and we got to do that with my dad. So it was time that we could spend with him. Yep. He was not really a hunter, and so when no, we got target shooting was big back then, wasn't oh, it? Real big. Yeah. We learned a lot at the time on, on reloading. But this was back, you know, in the day when um, 
you know, this is probably like 50 years ago. You could hunt railroad tracks. You could go oh, knock yeah. on a farmer's door, and as long as it wasn't the open, wasn't opener, posted. Um, really pretty easy for a bunch of kids in a Volkswagen. Um, no dogs. And were you in Indiana at the time? Iowa. Iowa. Okay. So eastern Iowa, Dubuque area. And so, and then I, when I went, I went to college in Iowa State. Well, that's kind of in the central of, of you know, the state where you've got a lot of pheasant. Yeah. And uh, we ran into our first quail. Yeah. But, again, we didn't have a dog because we were in college and I just wasn't <laughs> in the car at the time. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's interesting. So that's, that's a neat way to get started. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then since, and we're gonna we're gonna get into more of the of the program based stuff. But you are now a UKC field trial judge. Yes. Uh, office? Have you held office with CEB? Have you? Yes, I was Vice the sec- I was the secretary. Okay, that yeah. Um, three or four years. Yeah. And uh, then I was the president for. I guess I forgot I back in that. Two years. I forgot yeah. that stint. I was going to ask you if you're going to be running for president anytime soon. No. <laughs> <laughs> you did your term, huh? Been there, done that. <laughs> uh, and I know, um, and your wife, Kim, is sitting over here as a spectator today, and we're glad to have her. But I know she's been super helpful as uh, some of the show chairs for our All Breed shows at, at the Conclave, which we'll talk about later. So. I always appreciate going to one of those events when Kim's there because I know I'm not going to get asked questions about how to run the dog show. <laughs> so <laughs> that works out good. But I think uh, let's let's talk about let's start with talking a little bit about the breed. And I probably confuse people um, at the intro when I when I mentioned the word Epagnol Breton. So we'll back up and say when when the the breeders of the of this dog first came to UKC to ask about recognizing it as a separate breed. It was commonly referred to as the French Brittany. Correct. The, the, I think the the club was the French Brittany Gun Dog Association, right? Yeah, back in ninety seven, and then we I, I believe we started talking to you in oh two. Yeah. Um, as far as from a we need we wanted a registry. We didn't have a registry. Well, the, there was no registry that recognized the French Brittany as its own breed. Right. It was it, lumped it, in with the American Brittany. Correct. So, yeah. So, I know there was two different groups that came here to UKC to uh, discuss that. And eventually, it was the French Brittany Gun Dog Association that we went with. But over the course of the next how many years, the French Brittany... In this in this country is now being referred to as the Epagnol Breton. Mm-hmm. So, tell, what what do we know about the history of of that? What? So, if you go back into the early 1900s, like around 1907, is when they first started to recognize the breed um, in France. We had several people over there, and it developed. I don't remember. Maybe the 30s, they came up with some standards that. Um, you know, you start to start to use, and the standards have evolved very, very slow. Um, you know, we've got the orange and white, we got the tricolors, the black right. and whites, roans, um, typically a black nose that uh, you don't necessarily see. It's something that differentiates it from the American Brittany. Right, a little bit finer boned, a little bit shorter um, yeah. than you get with the American, you know, American Brittany, and so um, we tried to. Um, Follow the uh, uh, what the, the way the French was were, were working, and in two thousand seven, I believe it was, working with UKC, we reached out to our our French friends and got the breed standard and got the format right and the exact breed standard. So that would have come through FCI, which which Correct. was their registry over there. Correct. Yeah. And our, if I remember correctly, R.L. Del Ripple had it um, translated from, yeah. from fr- French to English, which, you know, is a challenge because it's not 100%. Right. And so uh, we went through that quite a bit, and, and we were really honored, if you will, that UKC wanted to use that format because that's not the format that UKC was using at the time. All right. And so uh, we've been able to use it um, and following it. I cannot i do not believe it's been updated 
or really tweaked since then. Right. Um, but. So for our listeners, you still hear the term Epagnol Breton and French Brittany used interchangeably. It's Correct. the same dog. That's why I said at the beginning, I don't want to confuse you. You're probably more familiar with these dogs than you think. We're talking about French Britneys. And today we refer to them at United Kennel Club as the Epagnol Breton. So let's talk about, um, are there any health concerns with EBs that are general like some of the other breeds? Not that it's a negative, but some things that the EB people have to watch for? There are some with the eyes okay. um, that you have to watch for. I've not heard that much about it. Right. I think it will. They have good hips typically. and t- Typically because they're pretty lightweight. Yeah. And so there's not a lot on those back hips, to, you know, like a lab. Yeah. Um, I think we will start to hear more because we're getting more breeders. And That's a good point. They are not, they're in the, the cell dogs, not necessarily for what we're in it for. So I, right. I think we're going to start to see some of the. So like a lot of breeds, buyer beware, check out your breeders, check out references. Right. If you go to the CBUS website, it lists a lot of good breeders. And you start talking um, to some of them, and, and there's a lot of other ones that aren't listed that are really, really good. Let's let's talk about. You might have touched on size a minute ago. What what is the typical? What's the standard safer weight range? Or so typically, you're, you're thirty plus or minus four yep. pounds probably. Yep. Females being a little bit smaller, you're twenty twenty two inches tall um, is your typical range. I think it's interesting that when you know, as I first started working with. The French Brittany Gun Dog Association, and I had not had a lot of exposure to the breed, and I thought, oh man, are are they that different than the American Brittanys? And man, it honestly, it took my first national event, and I think I could, I think our listeners right right now, if we were to have ten of them in this room or out in the field, and you was to explain this one's an EB and that one's an American Brittany, they could ident- they could identify them, they wouldn't miss one. Mm-hmm. They could easily identify the difference between the American Brittany and the Epagnol Breton, which that, in my mind, makes the case that it is definitely a different breed. Mm-hmm. And there's several breeds like that. The other one that comes to mind for me right now are the Cockers because I'm, I recently got a little field, uh, English Cocker. So, boy, the English Cockers and the American Cockers, you're not going to get those two confused. <laughs> you know, so that makes the case as right. definitely a different breed. So. Um, let's talk a little bit more about the EBs. Let's talk about what they're like in the field. And this one's going to be interesting for me. Things like, um, let's talk about range. And I'm sure you're going to probably, I'm guessing you're going to say it does depend on the bloodlines, even within the breed. Is that right? It'll depend on the bloodlines, but I think it depends more on the cover you're in and the terrain you're in. Yep. Good point. Um, you know, you start getting their, their, they can hunt the heavy, thick stuff that you get in Iowa. Yep. Um, it's a little more of a challenge because that's stuff you got to bust through. Yep. And they will not range out as far. You get them in the prairie out there in uh, Montana, and right. they will open up. Yep. Um, and you get that very much that windshield wiper yep. um, in front of you. Natural, the, a natural, quarter, a natural quartering. quartering. Um, they, they're very good at checking back in to make sure where you are. Now, some of the bigger males that run big, sometimes. Takes them longer to check in. Yeah. <laughs> they have their own timeline. <laughs> that is that is an important trait. As someone who owns an English setter right now who's not good about checking in, <laughs> I'm telling you, that's an important trait. What about um, as your puppies start to point? Are they naturally staunch, or is that something that trainers have to really work on? And and you, who's judging some tans, ought to have a good insight to this. When those young dogs start to point, are they just naturally staunch? They are if they're they've got the bird. If they're in a scent cone, yeah, you know, just like yeah, if you're hunting. But oh yeah, that they are they pretty rock hammer, solid little dogs will, right from the beginning. They will hammer it. Yeah. Now you'll get some creeping on the younger ones. In some of the older ones, but yeah. they will nail the bird. Yeah, that's interesting. What about retrieving? Natural retrievers or a little bit more work there? 
takes a little bit more work. There's probably more force fetching some going force on. Some fetching for people that are trialing at the upper uh, level. Particularly if you're trialing. Yeah. Um, some of them do better. Some of them do better with the smaller birds than they do with the bigger birds. Um, but retrieving, they like to retrieve. Yep. And backing, is that something you guys have to work with on drills? Or is that, they, they naturally tend to back on or another? I dog? think, I'm not very good about that. So I'm thinking it's, you got to work at it. Yeah. And you got to work, particularly at the at the open level, because you're working with dogs that are very competitive. It, it definitely depends from my experience on how you, inter, when, how you start them when you're hunting. If you're running, you're running a dog solo, he doesn't get that. He doesn't get that start. Right. If you're running with a brace mate. You know, I've had I've had young dogs that, you know, backed before they pointed their first bird because the old dogs pointing birds ahead of them and mm-hmm. they associate it. So that's interesting. Um, yeah. So there's your EBs in the field. What what are they like to live with? Are they a monster in the home? No. I probably should be asking Kim this question. But <laughs> <laughs> now, I mean, they are very good typically in a home. Now you get a puppy, you get a puppy. Yeah. But they will settle down. Um, both of ours that we brought home as puppies, they rode in Kim's lap on the way home and they were yeah. just as good as, as they could be. Um, but then, you know, you kind of get that terrible twos like you get with, with yeah. kids and then they get a little, that's when they get a little headstrong and, uh, you got to kind of work a little yeah, bit harder. Yeah, got to be the boss, right? And right. I'll tell you from my experience being around your dogs at your events, you can tell the ones that come from you know, a one or two dog family or the, or the ones that have their dogs in the house and the ones that are a kennel situation where their dogs aren't, it's a, it's a noticeable difference, but it should be, right? I mm-hmm. mean, your dogs are with you 24-7 in the house. They, The ones I've been around are, are very, seem to be relaxed or have an off switch. They are. So I think that speaks well for the breed. So that, in a nutshell, is... um. The EB, is there anything we missed about the dogs in particular? We talked about the color differences between the, the EBs two. and mm-hmm. the American Britneys. They can come in black and... Try. Uh, orange, orange and white is prevalent. Yeah. And, and if you look within the confirmation, it's orange and white and others. But even your orange and white dogs have a black nose. Right. So And, and orange and white is different color orange, depending upon the dog. Um, some of it's real bright. Some of it's a little bit more pale. so. And if I remember right, and you, you'll remember this, and I remember this being a topic, I don't know, five or ten years ago, sable is one of the colors that's a no-no in the breed. Right. The black hair coming up. Yep. Yeah. And we did see some of them at one time. There were a few. I there, there were a few. Don't see as many maybe anymore. No. And, and I think you just keep working out breeding it out. Yeah. So... Yeah, some de- definite differences between your American Brittany and your Epanol Breton, and that's that's why we like them. There's a dog for everybody out there. Uh, let's talk about you've mentioned it before, CEBUS, and that stands for Club de la Epanol yeah, Breton in the United States. Yep. Um, honestly, one of my favorite breed clubs, and I I work I've worked breed day events here for 35 years, and I got to admit, I, I love going to your guys' nationals. We have a great time there. Um, you, I, we talked earlier about the publication, and I, I wasn't aware that the publication wasn't being printed anymore, but that's, that's sad to see that go on. Or that was, we're getting you, newsletters and whatnot, and we're, we're going through this. Um, we grew the publication, I think, where it became too polished. Could be. Um, and too costly. It was very... Very well done. Um, and so I know I don't want my membership dues paying for the magazine. Yeah. You, you know, and, and as, well, it has to get spread around to cover a lot of things, right? Yeah. So um, I think that, and, and it's a, a lot of work. It's a lot of work to be the editor um, and finding the individuals to do that and continue to do that and continue to do that is a challenge. So yeah. um, I don't, they're working on it right now and they're trying to see what we can do about it. But it, that's one of the biggest challenges I think that we have to get our information it out to the masses. It would be great for new for new people. You do have some groups, some of your regional groups, though, that do newsletters. Like I know the Wo Post that Pete and Sherry do. Yep. That is predominantly Epanol Breton, not not solely, but predominantly. Right. That's a that's a great newsletter. Um, 
But we have to talk about conclave. So conclave is what you your association calls its uh, annual get together. Right. It's breed day's event. And you guys do a great job. Let's talk about talk about what all goes into conclave. Mm -hmm. So we try to bring um, typically a French judge, but it wouldn't have to be from France. Last year we had it from Spain. We've had it from uh, Canada. But we we have worked for the last 25 years to try to get some experienced people over there to help us and to grow the club and to also then be able to go back to France and say, these guys are, and gals are, they're serious about this stuff. Yep. And our dogs and our imported dogs have gotten better because we've worked at it. And, um, and it's working, right? I mean, mm -hmm. we're getting respect across the pond now from those judges that have been here. Correct. And they see the quality of the dogs. And it's not without its challenges, though. When you have a judge that you that doesn't speak your language and we need, we need interpreters. Um, it, it's a challenge. Um, we had one French judge a few years ago that had an app. Oh. That he could speak into it and we could get the English advice, <laughs> you know, vice versa. Because, quite frankly, they're better at English than we are <laughs> – yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that, that is a challenge. Now, we've had some uh, young people that were translators for us, and that's still a bit of a challenge because not all French is the same French, yeah. um, what we've learned. So, um, But they've been very good to work with us, very good to, to try it. It adds a, a neat element to the event. It really does. To have a you know, judge from the home country that's very experienced with the breed, Every, everybody learns. everybody learns something. Well, and what we've, we've asked them is to be hard on us. Okay, what are our shortcomings? Yeah. What do we need to do better? Because otherwise, we're not gaining anything. Um, and, you know, they're, they're a guest. And so that's hard. Oh, sure. Um, and some, you know, we've slept a few times, you know, with it. But that's always the conversation that, that we have is we don't want you to be easy on us. Our dogs are not all excellent. Yeah, that's a good point. So then conclave typically consists of, let me think, one or what? Yeah, we try to have a type W, which we'll get into later. We try to have a wild bird trial, a liberated bird trial, maybe maybe two days of one of those, a uh, confirmation show. Confirming. There's membership, yeah, confirming. The Auction. Why don't you talk a little bit about confirming because that's, that's something that I don't see with any of our other breeds. So what is the confirming process? So what we do from a confirming standpoint is we're confirming that the dog meets the breed standard. That's all. Right. The dog doesn't get rated or anything else. And if they're less than the, our but dog. But it's more of a process than simply entering the show and, say, winning your class in the show. It's a, right. It's a process. It's not part of the show. Right. It's typically held on the same day. But we have a confirmator who goes through goes over your dog and it's checking the, the head, the head plane, measuring, tail set. So far as measuring things, measuring right? Measuring for cobby, meaning you want the withers and the chest to the um, back, butt, basically, yep. to, to be um, the same. Yeah. Um, and you're looking at the, the rib cage and how round it, you know, it might be how flat the back is. They had to set the tail set. So, but um, ears... Where the ears are set, okay. The length of the ears, um, eye pigmentation, the bite. Um, I mean, it's probably a five minute, six minute overall, but it's very hands on. Um, and when you're done, you get you're, stamped as approved. Then you, that your that your dog is does meet the breed standard. Um, otherwise, you might get deferred because. Small female that's not two years of age, oh. you can defer them because they've got they've Going got some growth yet. So, um, and you try to look at that, but and um, you typically only confirm once okay. because you confirmed. Yep. Um, and you go through. So right now, off the top of my head, one, two, three, four, five. I think there are seven confirmators in the states. Have. No, two of them are in Canada, okay, and the rest are in the states. Um, a lot of us are getting a little long in the tooth. <laughs> <laughs> it's a really, it's a really neat process. I know the people learn a lot during mm -hmm. that, and um, 
it usually takes place on the day of the show, but not in the conjunction morning. with the show. Yeah. Yep. So then like all associations, you have meetings and banquets. Um, I think one of the neatest things though about your, your, your conclave is when you do your awards, it seems like it's usually the last night. Man, you get you get input from the judges, really detailed input on the runs that they judge. The win, right. they're winners. Right. It's not just saying first place is Bob's Sue. It's they go into detail about you know the top dogs that they saw, and it's really interesting. Right. It adds so much to the to the awards banquets, and I've been to plenty of them, and that that one is really well done. So I like that. Uh, so C E B U S C I. So um, you told me this morning how many members? Do you know approximately? Around two hundred and eighty. Yep. And very regional. I mean, it's scattered through around the country. Yeah, we have uh, clubs: South Carolina, Tennessee, Georgia. So what happens is, it, and we'll get in later. We'll get into talking about the UKC Pony Dog Program, which. The French Brittany Epagnol Breton people have been very supportive of. Regional clubs are popping up, and that's what Bob's talking about now. There are, I don't know, half dozen or more dozen regional clubs. Probably in 10, events. To, 10, 10 to 12. Yep, around the country right now, and they're very well supported. Um, for any new listeners that might have an EB or thinking about it, you will get a lot of help from these regional clubs. Yes. It, it seems like everybody's there to help each other. You know, don't feel apprehensive about because you don't know what you're doing about going to an event or getting together with, with the regional clubs. A lot of the regional clubs have fun days. They have training days. And the, and the whole goal there is to teach, to learn. Um, one thing about CEBUS, it's a family. It very much is. Yeah, very much a family, and I think one of its strengths anymore is more and more of the ladies are getting involved. They're running dogs. They're not just they're, they're a sec secretary here. They're a judge. Um, yeah. You, you name it. Um, our youth program kind of fluctuates depending upon, you know. Who's got young kids at the time. Yeah, young kids. So, um, but we're real proud of that also and the scholarships that we are able to, college scholarships. So. Yeah, it's a great organization. How do they find you? Um, CEBUS.org, is it? Org. I think it's .org. Don't find it there. Look, it's, don't put the org on there. Just go CEBUS. <laughs> I've, I've always been able to find it when I need to find something on there. And the website's well done. And you'll find someone to help you or get you steered in the right direction to a club in your region. Um. Yeah, so with that, we've, we've talked a little bit about, um, we've used some terms that are unique to the UKC Pointing Dog Field Trial Program. We'll, we're going to talk about Pointing Dog Program a little bit. Uh, I will say one of the things that's difficult for me, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to have to change in the near future, is up until two years, two years ago, most of our listeners know by now that we acquired American Field. So prior to that, the UKC Pony Dog Program was our only Pony Dog Program here. Now we have, with the addition of American Field, it feels awkward for me to still call one the UKC Pony Dog Program when, in essence, they are all UKC Pony Dog Programs at this point. So we got we got to work on that. But uh, what we were discussing earlier this morning, was it 2001 or 2003? 2001, I think we decided, was the, the first year of um, a licensed event, and it was with CEB, or French Brittany Gun Dog Association mm -hmm. at the time. It was held in Amo, Indiana, and I think that first event was a TAN only, wasn't it? It was a TAN only, TAN because a that's a, and a, a, show. And a show, because that's a NASTRA. Field. It's a master field. And they're yep. a typical 35, 40 fenced. Yep. Something yep. like that down there. So you're not running. We weren't ready for a field. No, we really <laughs> weren't. And it was everybody's first opportunity to get together and say, you know, what is it? But um, 
So leading into that, I, I can remember working with Bill and Kathy Dillon mm-hmm. a lot in those early years, getting the rules ready to hold a field trial or a tan. And then probably overlapping in and for the longest period afterwards, it was Fred Overby. Mm-hmm. And we really owe we owe both of them a lot for getting the UKC Pointing Dog program off the ground, a set of rules and um it was, works very well. How do you describe it when someone asks you, they know you're a dog person and you go to field trials, how how do you describe the UKC Pointing Dog program as opposed to other types of field trials? I think the UKC program is closer to hunting than not. I hear that. I hear that a lot. Yeah. I, there's some differences. Yeah. But I think it's closer. and. The di- one of the other differences is we have gun dogs and we have open dog. Open dogs are the polished dogs, pretty black and white, what you're looking for. The gun dogs is kind of like the minor leagues. Yeah. Good place to start to get some experience. You're not ready for the, for the you know, the open. And you're, a lot of the gun dogs, and mine have been that way for the most part, that's my hunting dogs. Yeah. I don't need them to be all... Field totally trial. broke. Yeah. Steady to wing and shot. So I think that's a, and the youth, that's a good place for the youth. Yep. Um, good place for anybody to, to start that's never run, just like we did this past, you know, weekend with the Capons. That good place to be. Yeah. And I, I can remember when we started, the thing I liked about it the most was you can go and enter the gun division, which is like he said, the entry level, and it's pass fail. Of up until your first title, which is hunt. And just by virtue of getting X number of passes, you can earn. So it's it's very supportive, much like our hunting retriever program where they're competing against a standard. It's pass fail. I don't have to beat Bob to right. get a title on my dog. And it's and people because of that are very helpful, you know. But at the end of the day, it is nice to name or recognize one dog had an exceptional day. Mm-hmm. And let's give him his due credit, you know. So he, we do award a first place. But people need to realize you can earn a title, you know, the, the first title without that first place win. Right. So right. that's what I loved about it right from the start. So it, so, gives, you, it gives you that, that taste of victory and success that, okay, I'm willing to take. But it doesn't take. make it overly competitive. Right. That's what's neat. Yeah. So basically, the difference between gun and open is the steadiness factor, I, I would say, wouldn't you? That I think it's the steadiness factor. I mean, I mean there's um, – you don't want any back casting. You don't chase feathered game or, or um, feathered or fur. fur. Yeah. Um, when you get to the, to the open, you're steady at the point until – the judge tells your, the handler to release your dog. Yep. If it's a, a liberated trial, retrieve the hand. Yep, because those are we shoot all birds at liberated trials. Right, and if it's um, wild, no. But it's the same. It's the steadiness, and the rules are pretty black and white as far as not a lot of interpretation from the from the judge. Um, you know, with the with the open. Yeah. And and we should say that much like the what we talked about the breed standard coming over from FCI, these field trial rules are very close to the European based mm-hmm. FCI program. Yep. From the from the start. That was important to this group and it works. Um, you know, with several mo- there's needs to be some modifications for this country, but it is. It was designed and still is largely European based, mm-hmm. and it's it's appealing to a lot of the groups that have the continental breeds. Right. So, in addition to the EBs in the early days, we saw the Portuguese pointers. A lot of these dogs are dogs that you know many of us have not seen in the field. So it's it's neat that when you see them come together as a breed club, you got the Portuguese pointer, the wire haired Vishla. Um. Red and white setter, setters, Irish red and white setters. They were very involved at one time, and then this weekend was a new was a new group for us. And you were you were at one of their inaugural events. Yes, where was the Griffons? The, the Griffons. Um, they had an event out in Idaho the week before. Yep. Then we went up to Highland 
um, Michigan, Michigan um, you know, just north of where we're at right now. And uh, very, one, it's a great group. The dogs were very, very good. Um, it, was, it was, you know, a lot of fun. And it was a lot of, as a judge, it was one, an honor to go to their inaugural one, but it's also an honor to be able to sit there and educate, teach, promote. Um, you, you, particularly because you've got guns, you look at things a little bit different as how you're judging those dogs to keep things, keep things fun. Yeah, that's, that's, that's important and, and make it, you know, people comfortable, mm -hmm. make it fun for the dogs, keep people comfortable. So they want to be involved. That, I think this program is perfect for that. Mm -hmm. Proud of that. Uh, we touched on the two types of trials. So type L would be a liberated trial. That's for portions of the country that don't have a wild bird population. So in essence, you can run these trials coast to coast, whether you have wild birds or not. Correct. So we have a liberated format, like Bob said, where birds, where we do shoot birds and judges retrieve. If a club or an event is in um, the wild bird area, you can do a type W trial, mm -hmm. which has its own set of uniqueness. You know, your, your, your dog has to work and be steady on a wild bird. And that's its own challenge, right? Right. Obviously, we don't we don't shoot birds in in those trials, um, but that's unique about our program is having the liberated in the wild well. factor. And it seems like CEB's US has always been good about holding their conclave in an area where you can offer both. We we try to do that. We try but, to, but we also try to spread it around the country. Yeah. Um. Anywhere from. Montana, South Dakota, North Dakota, Minnesota, down to Georgia. Georgia. Um, we try to move it around. Iowa's had several. Yep. Going to Nebraska this next year. Is that right? We're going to Oklahoma. Oklahoma, Oklahoma. Oklahoma just south of Oklahoma City. Yeah. So, yeah, I, that's, that's something that's unique that I really like. Um, gosh, I don't know. In, in closing for me, one, one of the things that I would – think it's a stumbling block or make some people uncomfortable would be the terminology, especially when you get into our awards <laughs> and placements. I mean, I still have to get my rule book out and reference that because it there again, it is largely based on the European format for awards. Mm -hmm. It's I, my point is to the listeners, don't, don't let that dissuade you or, it's different, but but it's not. It shouldn't be scary, right? I mean, it just. I always go back to first, second. Yeah, knowing that we 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 changed some of the terminology. You know, a pass is a pass. Yeah. So that you know hasn't changed, but um, but it's still things like pass with honor and there's yeah you know, there's some some levels that we're not used to in this country, but again, it makes it unique. Um, it's to be celebrated. People, it's, right. you know, people that are especially the ones that are, you know, like the closeness um, through the breed to the, their home country. It's it's cool. Mm -hmm. it, it's different. But I, one of my points would be don't let don't let the terminology differences worry you. We're still running dogs, right? right? They're still expected to point, be steady. Yep. Retrieve birds. Any other thoughts on what we could tell people? direct people to UKC field trial program or CEB or to the breed. Did we miss anything? I don't know that. I think we've covered a lot of it yeah. when it comes, when it comes down to that. I know one of, one of the things I wanted to close was with was um, how you happen to be here today. Uh, I should say that as I do these podcasts, I much prefer to do them in person. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I try to take advantage of when people are coming through Kalamazoo and you and your group. I think seven out of the – well, we should back up. So as dogs participate in confirmation shows over the year, during the year, the ones that place the most at the biggest shows will place in a top ten standing for the breed. Correct. And then once a year – in conjunction with the Premier Nationals, which is a large dog show that UKC hosts right here in Kalamazoo, um, 
everybody's in town, the, at least the dogs that placed in the top 10, to show for the top 10 overall, which was today. Correct. So you and Kim had two dogs in there. Yep. Seven so, out of 10 dogs, that's pretty good representation for any breed. It, very good. Yeah. Um, there weren't that many that, that beat us, I don't think, out of, the, yeah. out of that. And uh, the, the thing for, for Kim and I, what's important to go to these shows with a young dog is they get exposed. Yeah. They get exposed to dogs and noises, and, it, and that's part of their upbringing and part of what they, what they have to have. In the Midwest, there's a lot of these, a lot of these shows. So, and, it, and it brings you together, again, with more people. Yeah. Like the group that we came in here today with, I don't know the other dogs hunt. Yeah. Okay. Which is fine. Yeah. But they were, you know, in the top 10, got to compete in the top 10. We had a, a gun dog type judge, which was good for us. Well, and it, it introduces people. All, all of those will eventually go to Conclave and will try to put a tan on their dog mm -hmm. or, you know, be interested to try the field trials right it's how you it's how you grow your sport you got to start somewhere right so yeah that that's that's what was neat and that's that's how you and kim happen to be here today um appreciate you coming into the office and to the podcast studio and being able to i don't know get a little bit more information out there on your breed and mm -hmm. your breed club and the ukc field trial program so i hope we did it all justice I, I think we did. Thank you for, you know, asking us to be here. Um, well, you've been in Michigan. Gosh, you've been in Michigan more in the last 10 days than you've been in Indiana. Pretty much. <laughs> um, but, you know, we, we very much appreciate UKC. We appreciate everything that you've done um, for us, for the breed, um, in, in how we've been able to have a role yeah. um, to, develop, to develop that. I think that was um, – was an – it's well, it, be was, more important. it was key for me. I could not have done it without the assistance of the Peniel Breton people. And I think because that it's, they've really, you know, uh, what's the term? They've really clung to this program. It's it's been it's been important to them, and it's important to United Kennel Club. So and it's been fun. It's this is a project I was able to be at be with since the first day, and. Mm -hmm. Gosh, it's fun to look back on that stuff, isn't it? <laughs> yep, very much so. We've had some great past presidents, some that are no longer with us, and I'm sure that's like most clubs. But you said it—you said it best. It's really, it's really like a family. Mm -hmm. and, yep. So anybody that's interested in learning more about Epanuel Bertans can contact us at United Kennel Club or can check out CEBUS and um, learn more about this great little breed of dog. Thank you for listening to the UKC Hunting Ops Podcast. Be sure to give us a follow so you don't miss any of our new episodes or content.